let's get started here. Um, so I think that the God cam is working a little better today, so we should be we should be good to go with that. Uh, I know I threw a lot of stuff at you kind of first week, a lot of review of some 201 stuff, a little bit of linear regression. Um, for kind of the beginning part of the course, primarily Thursdays when we talk about or kind of go over those readings, uh, those will be the days I focus or kind of introduce a little bit more linear regression discussion. So we get start to get more familiar as every week goes by with that. Uh, but the bulk of kind of what we'll work through Tuesdays and most of class on the half, first half of class on Thursdays um, will be more like econ related as opposed to just statistics. So let's look here. I guess I'll leave myself down here for the video for today. So if we go to course page, files, course readings. I kind of group them by, by weeks. So I put two papers up there um, that I want you to try to kind of skim through, read the introduction, kind of read the conclusion, just try to familiarize yourself a little bit with, with what the paper is trying, you know, the question they're trying to answer. You can choose either one of these um, and we'll, we'll discuss both of them. So you can, you can read either one. You don't have to do both. Uh, and we'll, we'll kind of review those on Thursday. So those are sitting up there under the week two papers under course readings, okay? We've got our lecture slides post for the week. So one thing I didn't do week one, because I forgot to be completely honest, is that some computers have some issues pulling up um, the PowerPoint. I think this might have been fixed since I, I now have the, the newest version. I currently had kind of the older version of, of PowerPoint. Um, but if you ever have any issues with opening the PowerPoint, I'll also post the same exact slides, but as a PDF, right? I know some, I think Chromebooks sometimes have some issues, so PDFs will be fine uh, for those. So uh, with that being said, any questions for me before we kind of jump into things here? We good? All right. So we kind of left off last class. Um, we went through some supply and demand stuff, talked a little bit about equilibrium, uh, sh things that would shift supply and demand. But it was a pretty general discussion, right? It wasn't really a whole, I gave you some sports related examples. Um, but really, that was just a general discussion of, of supply and demand and, and equilibrium in markets. So we're going to see something that was a little bit different than probably what you've, you've done in most of your econ classes here when we look at the ticket price market. So usually, you know, we have this increasing supply curve, right? And it kind of represents that as we produce or we kind of sell each additional unit, our costs are rising, right? That very first unit was kind of the, the, the lowest cost and those marginal costs rise. So with a ticket market, this doesn't really quite apply, right? So we don't really have an increasing marginal cost curve. So if you think about, we could use this room as an example. It's not an arena or a stadium or anything, but if I was selling tickets, let's say someone's gonna give a talk here and I'm selling tickets to each one of these seats, can I change can I increase the number of seats in this room, right? I mean, if, given my, my capacity constraints, no, right? right? It has the number of seats that it has, okay? So just like a stadium, that would be just like a stadium, right? They have the number of seats that they have. Maybe down the road, they can add more or do some, you know, re, re, uh, renovations. But for the current game, right, they're subject to however many tickets they have, however many seats they physically have. So to provide an additional seat, it's already there. The marginal cost is essentially zero, right? So if we think about um, the number of seats in a stadium, really up until we hit that capacity, our marginal costs are zero, right? There was probably huge fixed costs into, you know, building that, that stadium and then however many seats are in it, but the marginal costs are zero, right? There are, the, the, you know, the seats, are, the seats are already there. So, what we're going to think about is our supply curve, we'll say it's actually vertical. Now, and when I'm going to draw it out for you here in a second, it's not probably the, the best description, but we'll think about it as vertical. Okay. And it's going to be a vertical line at whatever our stadium capacity is. Now, demand for tickets will, will, will behave just like demand for any other product. So no, nothing different going on there. And we'll talk about a few exceptions that might exist to this rule. Um, AAA baseball, you know, they, they, um, a lot of these stadiums will rope off parts of the stadium they don't sell tickets to, so they can kind of decrease their, their capacity. But for the most part, we can think about there is some maximum capacity at every one of these stadiums, every one of these arenas. Okay. 
Um, I guess another exception would be, although this is kind of a long run thing as opposed to short run, if you're thinking about companies like the UFC um, or, or different organizations that can choose their location, right? They're not subject to be you know, playing just in this one city, then they have a little bit more flexibility, right? They can increase their cost, move to a higher, higher capacity stadium, and they might face a more traditional kind of increasing marginal cost curve there as well. Uh, but, you know, once it's, <laughs> if that is the case, then it just goes back to how we would generally treat kind of these examples with supply and demand. The ticket market where we have this fixed capacity is going to present some interesting issues. So, um, so I, I think maybe the best way to think about this is we're thinking about the ticket mark within, sorry, ticket market within one season. Okay, not kind of making long run changes. Okay. So I've got a discussion of demand shifters here, but um, and let's see, I'm not sure how this is gonna record. So hopefully this. There we go. We've got kind of where I can do some work. So we think about the market for tickets. And if I ever start drawing off the screen or anything, let me know. I know this is a little blurry, but hopefully it looks a lot better than last class. So here we've got kind of our quantity for tickets on the x-axis. We can think about the price of those tickets is going to be on our y-axis. We said there's no difference, right, in demand, right? We said last class we can think about demand as also the marginal benefit curve. I also said we could think of the supply curve as a marginal cost curve, right? Well, if this, the seats are already there, right, the marginal cost of supplying the first seat is zero. It's already there, right? I just, you know, I don't have to spend any money. It's already, it already exists. The same holds true for every single quantity up until, right, and think about whatever my arena or my stadium's capacity is. Once I hit that capacity, I can't provide any additional seats, right? They, they, don't, they don't exist. So that's why we said we can think of supply, the supply curve here is vertical, all right? So if that supply curve is vertical and demand is high enough, right? We get kind of the equilibrium price for a ticket and then what would be the equilibrium quantity for tickets there? Well, it is the supply curve, which would be equal to the capacity, the number of seats we have. Right? So you can kind of think about here, if we really want to identify it, there's our equilibrium quantity, right? Because demand was high enough, right, that we hit that supply curve um, and kind of following that point down, that will be our equilibrium quantity. Everybody okay with that? Any questions on, on that before we keep moving? If I guess I'm gonna be a little bit more complete, you know, part of this discussion of the marginal cost being zero is because the supply curve represents our marginal costs. Really your supply curve is actually a horizontal line along the x-axis and then a vertical curve once you hit capacity. Okay? Now you could make some crazier models where, you know, you think I've got like, I always kind of say, you know, for the sake of the examples we're going to be doing, we can, we can treat it as though it's horizontal along that X axis. If I'm going to say, I don't know, try to mimic the real costs, I'm probably thinking that yes, the ticket or the, uh, the seats are already there, but depending on how many tickets I sell, what's something maybe I would still have to increase as I sell more tickets if I'm running this arena, right, what are some things I have to make sure for every game are going to be there? Uh, food. food, so vendors, right? If I don't sell, if I sell half as many tickets, do I need near as many people walking around trying to sell food? No. So there probably is like this slightly increasing marginal cost, but those costs are still relatively low when you spread them out over the number of tickets you're selling. Um, or even if you think about, uh, yeah, so that's a good, good way to think about it. And then, so they might be slowly increasing and then you hit capacity and you have a vertical line, right? But for the sake, you know, 
of what we're doing. We're just going to treat it as though it runs along horizontal along the x axis and that the marginal costs are zero. But you could probably argue that there are some minimally increasing marginal costs up until we hit capacity. All right, so I want to draw another scenario for you, right? The, the first scenario I drew for you, we had enough demand to sell out the stadium. What if, and I'll just do Q subscript T for quantity of tickets, kind of moving forward. Got demand. Well, hold on. Forgot what I'm trying to show you. And got overzealous with demand there. <laughs> um, so let's say I've got demand. I need to leave myself a little room here. So that's my demand curve. And let's say my capacity is all the way out here. Theoretically, where should my equilibrium point be? It's gonna be wherever my supply curve intersects with my demand curve, right? Or the marginal benefit of that last ticket purchased is the same as that marginal cost, right? So if I have demand that's low enough, theoretically, Remember, it runs along the x-axis, so demand actually would intersect my supply curve on that x-axis. So theoretically there, how much would I charge for tickets? Zero dollars, right? If demand was low enough, and I'm simply concerned about trying to get people in the city, I'm just gonna give the tickets away for, for free, right? Because if I try to charge any price, right, that's above zero there, um, I'm not gonna be able to kind of, kind of sell. So it's kind of a unique feature. Now, <laughs> are there, is, is demand um, always gonna be high enough to kind of to hit capacity? Uh, probably not. Um, once we get to things like profit maximizing though, um, we might talk about, you know, what if this was a monopoly? Why don't we see then, you know, why do we see stadiums that don't sell out even though, right, the, the Price is, is above zero, right? Why, why wouldn't that happen? So that's because this is a perfectly competitive market. And what we actually see in real life, all these markets are essentially monopolies, right? But if we had a perfectly competitive market, we could see something like this where we sell less than capacity and we basically just give away the tickets, right? Any questions on that? Right, so we're just saying this is kind of equilibrium price here. Yep, so we got price on our, our y-axis, quantity of tickets on our x-axis x axis here. Okay. What if, so we got two scenarios. So let's say I've got demands pretty low. What happens, let's say, I don't know, average income in the US goes way, way up. What's gonna do, what's gonna, uh, what is that gonna do to my demand curve? Higher income, if this is a normal good, right? which, you know, unless I'm talking about something like a minor league game, we can safely assume that it's probably a normal good. Demand would shift up. My new equilibrium is a much higher price, call this P star two maybe, and my new equilibrium quantity, right, is, is quite a bit higher, right, it meets capacity, okay? What could happen if the demand shift wasn't very large? So here we'll go kind of large demand shift. Oh, there we go. Led to prices going up and quantity going up, right? Let's say, and we'll even give it a couple adjectives here. Let's say I see a very small demand shift. Okay. What could happen to the equilibrium quantity and price. Be a little bit different than this. Yeah, so let's say I see like a really small shift in demand. So we'll call this kind of a different type of shift, right? My new equilibrium point would still be on the x-axis. So I'd still be having an equilibrium price of zero. So price doesn't change. I'll kind of, here we could draw it this way, doesn't change. And maybe call this Q star three, 
we could see quantity increase. But no matter what the demand shift, we see an increase in the quantity of tickets we sell. But theoretically, if we had a very low starting demand, that demand increase may actually not cause the price to change. Okay. It's kind of a kind of weird, but it is possible. And if you go back to thinking about um, when we had demand that was high enough to hit the capacity initially, well, any increases in demand here are going to do what? Well, here's our new equilibrium point. So now we could call this our new equilibrium price and our new equilibrium quantity. So notice when demand was initially already meeting capacity, we can't sell more than the capacity number of tickets, right? So, so, I mean, if we just intuitively take a second and think, okay, we were already selling out the stadium, demand went up, we can't do more than sell out the stadium. So quantity there is gonna stay the same, whereas that demand increase is gonna push prices up, right? And that we typically would see the price being driven up from demand increases in a, in a normal market. And uh, we see that here in the ticket market, the kind of, the difference is we could see that the quantity doesn't change if demand was initially high enough to be meeting capacity, okay? So we kind of had both scenarios there, one where initial demand was low, one where uh, initial demand was high. And we kind of looked at what demand shifts would, how, how demand shifts would change the equilibriums you know, in both those scenarios, okay? Any questions on any of that? Do you want to see any of that again? Like make, make me point something out or clarification? Hopefully I'm okay on, on Zoom. If I'm, if I'm not sounding great on Zoom, let me know, blow up the chat. Uh, but I think, I think everything should be sounding good. Okay, so this is, you know, we have a little bit different thing going on with the ticket market, uh, but now at least we now kind of have this frame of reference. So here's, let's go back here. So we kind of already talked about uh, some of these things. Um, sometimes I'll put things in the slide and I'll just mention them as I work through the examples that I'm drawing them out. But you can imagine things that might shift the demand curve. I think the example I gave just now was um, higher income overall, but it could be things like we have a higher quality team, right? A team that's winning more this year. That could increase the demand curve, right? We could have you know, opponent quality is higher or lower, right? You can imagine, you know, so these are some of all, some of the things that we would say like our catch-alls, right? They're kind of these, not normal to other goods, right? But, but pretty common demand shifters that we might see in the ticket market. Right? You could see, you know, rivalries. We typically see that the ticket prices are much higher, like because the demand curve is much higher, right? Which we just, we just uh, saw an example of, of how that increase in demand increases ticket prices. We can think of things like timing of the game, right? What time of the day, what day of the week, uh, over winter break. So I always like to, to give this, you know, one thing that greatly decreases demand specifically uh, for, for student ticket sales uh, is you, if you look at some of the college basketball games that are played over winter break, uh, you can you know, just immediately see economics playing out in real life because the prices of the tickets, some of them are less than $10, right? Whereas even for these, these high quality teams, typically sell out their stadiums, you know, over that winter break period, we see that that huge demand shift decrease, right? Decreases ticket prices, okay? Uh, televised games or not, I and mean, kind of think about there's a substitute good thing going on there. You know, if the game is televised, we can think about attending the game in person or watching the game on TV are actually substitute goods, right? I can only do, Okay, when I say I can only do one of them at a time, let's think about watching the game in my home versus kind of being at the stadium watching the game live. All right, those are substitute goods. And if the price maybe of tickets gets high enough, right, we could see the demand for watching the game on television go up. You know, so we kind of have this, this substitute good thing going on there. Or, you know, if cable companies start charging a high enough demand, and I, I live near enough, to, to a professional team, I may not purchase you know, cable television to watch the game and instead attend um, in person. So I'll give you an example. It, it sounds kind of far-fetched, but I, uh, you know, if you look at the total cost of, um, what is it called? The NFL, not the red zone. There's another one. Sunday ticket. 
That's right. Sunday ticket, right? Um, so you have to have direct TV in order to purchase it. And so that the total cost gets relative pretty, pretty high, right? If I'm living in kind of downtown Chicago, I'm probably like not going to get that. And if I'm a Bears fan, I'm just going to go watch the games live as long as I, you know, can get access to the tickets. So, you know, this also probably applies less to professional sports and maybe more towards like college level sports as well, where you have to buy different packages to get that particular uh, conferences network or something like that. But these are some things we can think about that would shift demand. So here's just kind of a, a sample um, graph. I'm going to do kind of our own here in class, but for those of you kind of going back through the slides, I have this picture as just kind of a reminder of, you know, anytime you see a graph in the slides, it probably means I drew one in class and probably did a little bit more than what actually shows up here on the slide. Okay. So let's go back here. Isn't very far fetched. We think about what we're doing with, well, I probably shouldn't have these stacked on each other, but if we think about the ticket market here, so quantity of tickets, price, right? Um, got my demand curve. We're going to go through one where we're meeting capacity pretty easily here with this demand. Okay. So the equilibrium price here, and I'll just put some numbers to it. Let's say the equilibrium price, I don't know, is $100. I don't know, capacity is, I don't know, 10,000, right? So if I look at this and the price is $100, maybe I'm looking at like at a college basketball arena here. Relatively small, uh, but it's a good program. And so they, they sell out their, you know, their stadium, maybe think about like Duke or something like that. But if I'm a college student, this is a pretty daunting price to go attend games, right? hundred dollars per, per ticket. And so we look at this equilibrium price and you know, someone higher up, you can kind of think about maybe usually this is the government getting involved, but in sports, sometimes this is just like the league getting involved or the NCAA coming down and imposing some type of regulation, right? So they look at this and said, well, look, um, you're charging $100, like that's way too high. Our, our kids can't afford it. We want to have the college kids be able to attend the game. And so they say, look, we're not going to, we're going to put a price ceiling. And I don't know, let's say, let's do some, a dramatic one right here, right? We'll say that you can't sell these tickets for more than $25, right? We're putting a ceiling on the price that you can charge, okay? So that sounds really good in theory. We'll talk about a couple problems here in a second, but that sounds good in theory because now your kind of typical college student is able to afford that, right? So, or it's just a more, or even if they could have afforded it before and were willing to pay it before, we're not taking a bunch of, of money away from our, our college students. So now, obviously, if I can't charge a price higher than this, the new equilibrium price, think about this as kind of the, new equilibrium price after the price ceiling, right, is going to be whatever the price ceiling set at, right? So I've got this lower price, but what happens to quantity here? Well, that was already meeting capacity. So this new equilibrium quantity is, is going to remain unchanged, right? So this kind of, you know, I guess, you know, these price ceilings are being imposed for moral reasons. So maybe there's some externalities we don't have drawn in the graph, but you can clearly see, you know, the team that's selling these tickets is going to be pretty upset, right? They're still selling the same number of tickets, but they're losing out $75 on every single ticket they sell, right? But like I said, maybe there's some externalities. Maybe there's, you know, we're trying to kind of fix some things with regulation. I'm not, you'll see throughout the semester, I'm, I'll probably, you know, economics provides us a lot of examples where government intervention likely leads to worse outcomes. <laughs> um, and I'll try to always kind of give both sides of that as well and make the arguments for why that government intervention might have been uh, useful. But here we can see it's decreased the price. So one of the problems with this is at this new price, right? How many people, if we didn't have capacity constraints, right? Would be willing to purchase these, these tickets? Well, it's gonna be a much higher number. We'll just put a number to it. We'll say there's now 15,000 people who would be willing to purchase a ticket to the game at $25, this price ceiling, okay? The problem is who's gonna get 
the 10,000 that exist, right? There's gonna be 5,000 people who want to buy the ticket, but aren't able to, because there's no additional seats past 10,000. So almost think about it as here, right? This 15,000 we can think about is my quantity demanded, but the quantity supplied can only ever be at maximum what the capacity is, okay? So if we have quantity demanded being greater than my quantity supplied, people want more than what exists, this price ceiling creates a shortage, right? So there's now much higher demand than there is supply at that price. And so we would say we have a shortage. So with the shortage, there's 5,000 people who are gonna get this ticket, but which 5,000? Let's just for a second think about, I don't know what the allocation of these tickets would be. Like a lot of universities have these, uh, I know like IU, you can buy like a lottery and then your name gets pulled for whether or not you get a ticket. So it doesn't matter what the process of, uh, is of giving out these tickets. Let's just say it's first come first serve. And it just so happens that the people who show up in line first for those tickets, let's say, are these people right here, these people along the demand curve, right? So maybe we start here at, you know, 5,000, you know, within that range, these are the people that end up purchasing the ticket, right? We said demand is marginal benefit. So each ticket purchased here has a marginal benefit that's greater than the cost of the ticket. Right? The cost of that ticket was forced to only be $25. So everybody here values it more than the cost. So they would purchase it, right? Marginal benefit is greater than marginal cost. I'll purchase it. So that's great. But who are the 5,000 people who don't get the ticket, right? So we'll call these, right? I don't know, ticket purchasers or something. Well, if it just so happened that the people who didn't get tickets were these first 5,000 who valued it the most, well, that doesn't quite seem fair either because now the people who aren't getting the tickets were actually the ones who valued it most. We actually lost out on some surplus there, right? We lost out on quite a bit of surplus. In order to minimize kind of the surplus loss there, we would wanna to try to make sure that the people who, the 10,000 people who valued it the highest were actually the ones who end up being able to purchase the tickets. Now, how do we ensure that? It's very difficult to do, right? It's very hard to identify exactly which consumers, you know, value, you know, what their valuation is and where they fall in that demand curve. So this would be kind of an argument about why price ceilings are pretty ineffective, right? Because you're not only are they cutting into the revenues and the profits of whatever, you know, team, or we want to think about this as like, could be a concert, um, whoever's selling those tickets, it cuts into their profits, but it also doesn't really guarantee that allocation is going to those who value that good the most, okay? I know there's a lot going on in this graph. Any, any questions on that before we keep moving here? Okay. All right, so I need to be better about switching back and forth between the screens. So, you know, we kind of already talked about quite a few of these. Um, you know, one nice thing that a price ceiling could do, I mean, I guess, you know, in the example I drew, the demand was, was already easily high enough um, where we were hitting capacity, you know, but if you push the price ceiling low enough, if you can push it down to zero, you can probably guarantee that you're selling out the stadium. However, if I can get this to work, there we go. We talked about the allocation, you know, doesn't necessarily go to those who, who value it the most, right? Um, and what actually can happen, right? If we go back, I'm gonna to try to switch back and forth a little bit easier here. If we go tickets are released and they allow me to buy large blocks, well, guess what? I might buy 5,000 tickets, but I didn't value them very high and then resell them to someone who valued them higher because if I'm gonna resell them, I might not be subject to this price ceiling constraint, right? The actual school or whatever who's selling it, they couldn't sell it over $25. But once I've purchased it, once I have this, 
block of 5,000 tickets, I know that there's 5,000 people up here who are willing to pay well over $100, and I'll try to then just resell that block of tickets that I purchased, right? So this is kind of how, you know, um, you know, is that really fair? It doesn't really seem that way, right? Um, you know, the issue there is price ceilings are very hard to impose at several levels, right? If, if the people who purchase these tickets were still subject to only selling it, those tickets for $25, well, then we wouldn't really have those concerns, right? But a lot of the times, I won't call it necessarily a black market, but right, this resale market isn't subject to that price ceiling, okay? All right, let's see, should be able to, I don't know if I'm gonna be creating a bunch of new shares. Oh, there we go, okay. Um, so we talked about that. So yeah, scalpers or StubHub. One solution that they've kind of come up with this, like, you know, to, instead of using a price ceiling, uh, another thing that they've, they've done is impose a price ceiling, but require that for whatever group that they believe isn't able to get like a fair access to those tickets, like students, making sure that, you know, to purchase the ticket at this lower price ceiling price, you have to provide a student ID, right? Or another example, you have to kind of provide kind of uh, evidence of, um, you know, you're over 65 or, you know, whatever the group that they're, they're trying to lower the price for is. Okay. All right. Um, so we talked about a price ceiling uh, in these ticket markets. We can think about how price floors would work. Um, so price ceiling is that you can't charge a price above a certain level. A price floor would be you can't sell tickets at a price lower than whatever this price floor is that I'm setting, okay? So we'll think about how this would work in the ticket market, and then I'll, I'll think about another market that we could see this in, right? So I'm leaving this kind of slide open. It means we're gonna do some, some work here. I'm gonna write down some stuff. So, all right, got another graph here. Here's my quantity of tickets. Here's my price. So I want to do a price floor here. So let's go, what will be the more interesting one? So I'm going to get set the equilibrium high. We'll do this. We'll do a conventional one kind of. So we'll do demands here. Here's my capacity, right, or my supply curve. Here's where my equilibrium ticket price would have been. And kind of here's where my equilibrium quantity would have been. Right? So after I impose this price for, and I'll put some numbers. In. So let's say this is uh, $50 here. Okay. So let's say that I think that this is a pretty low price. Um, and for whatever reason, well, let's say, let's say this even could be done through the, a different platform like StubHub, um, where they want to make sure that, I don't know, that StubHub isn't undercutting the price of the college selling or something. So they impose kind of this price floor and say, I see that you're selling them for $50, but we don't want, you know, we're not going to allow these tickets to be sold for anything less than 75. So there's this price floor and you can't go below it. Okay. I'm not gonna allow you to sell tickets for less than $75. Right? You could imagine this could also just be a uh, optics thing, kind of like a PR, like maybe the owner of the team doesn't want their tickets to look like people aren't wanting to come to the game. So they say you can't sell them for less than 75. Now, what are the implications of that? Well, now, if I think about at this price floor, quantity supplied is right here, quantity demanded, at that price is right here. So if we have quantity demanded now being less than the quantity supplied, we have a surplus of tickets. Notice, call this kind of Q star, our capacity has went down, right? We were selling out before, but now at this imposed price floor, we're actually selling under capacity. So that maybe doesn't look good if that's on TV or something, but you know, if the game isn't televised and you're just trying to keep this image that these tickets are highly valued and so you're going to set this price floor and not sell them for anything less, you know, this is the implications that you would get. You'd be selling fewer tickets 
but at this higher price, right? You can kind of think about here, it's a little bit difficult, and we'll have a, a discussion uh, about surplus here. So I think about surplus in this market, right? The area under the equilibrium price, right? But above the supply curve, we call that producer surplus. And we'll do a more lengthy review of surplus here in a second, but hopefully you can kind of remember some of this discussion from your 201 class or other classes. So producer surplus is how much they're selling the ticket for and how much it costs them to sell the ticket. So this area we can think of as producer surplus, right? If I get to keep $50 when I sell the ticket and it costs me zero to provide it, each ticket I sell, I gain kind of this $50 in surplus. This area right here, and I'll try to do vertical lines here. And I'm doing before the price ceiling first, right? These kind of vertical lines, um, if I can write, represents consumer surplus, right? The demand curve represents how much they value the good and then price is how much they actually have to pay for it. So the difference between the two is kind of for the consumer, like the net surplus there, right? How much I value it minus how much it costs me to buy it, right? So this area will represent consumer surplus. Once I move back, after I see that price floor change and my quantity decreases, kind of you can think about, well, I'm no longer selling these tickets. And so all the tickets that I'm now not selling represent a loss in total surplus, right? So we had producer surplus down here, this lower rectangle, consumer surplus, this upper triangle. We add those two together, we call that total surplus. So once we impose this price ceiling, we lost this total surplus. Some of it came from producers, some of it came from consumers. Any questions on that? I guess I know I will we'll go more in depth into some surplus stuff later on, but I did want to mention that uh, at this point. Okay. Okay with that. All right. I think before we go back to the slides here, let me check online. Okay. We're good. We're going to go through, all right. Another um, fairly common price floor right, that you might see out there, and it's actually pretty relevant right now, is uh, the minimum wage. Okay. So actually, I'll go through, um, I'll do a minimum wage, so we'll do a labor market example, right, and we'll think about this just in general, um, could be like people who work at the stadium, right, so maybe your vendors or your people who are kind of uh, behind the counters when you're buying food or, or, you know, drinks, so we'll think about what that market would look like if we imposed a price floor. So on our x-axis, we'll have the quantity of labor. So as we start to look at this labor market more and more, we'll really have some more like philosophical discussions about what this really means. Because the quantity of labor, the easiest way to think about it is just the number of workers, right? But we can actually analyze labor markets within one person. And their quantity of labor would be how many hours they provide, right? We can even take it a step further. We can think about not just the hours I, I provide, but maybe kind of the quality of the hours I provide. We can really kind of get, get pretty, uh, we can define this a little bit differently to analyze different issues. But for now, we're gonna think about this as like a labor market for all workers. So we'll think about the quantity of labor here as the number of workers, okay? Um, but just in general, we'll write, anytime we're looking at a labor market, just the quantity of labor here. I think I mentioned this last class, but the difference in the labor market and the goods market is the price. Well, usually it's just the price of whatever we're selling. The price of what's on the x-axis now is the wage, right? And we can break this down once again. You can look at salaries. You could, you could, wage could be hourly wage. Um, wage plus benefits you could even put in here, right? So, but for the sake of kind of where we're starting out, you can just think about this as the hourly wage, right? We're looking at how a minimum wage would affect this market. So here we've got kind of the demand for labor. You think about the supply of labor if we're just looking at the overall kind of labor market. Okay. So 
kind of start out here, equilibrium quantity of labor, and we'll call this the equilibrium wage. So maybe like right now, I think the federal, someone, I should, I should probably know this off the top of my head. I think it's 725, but for some reason, oh, it is. I, for some reason, I felt like it was maybe 735 and I was just remembering it incorrectly. Um, it's currently 725. Let's say the government comes in and says that's way too low. It really sucks to live off of a minimum wage that low. So we're going to say that we're going to raise the minimum wage to $15, right? So I'm really, what I'm doing there is I'm saying, I'm actually imposing a price floor or in the context of this example, we're calling it a minimum wage, right? Because I'm saying, I know the equilibrium is a lower price, but I'm telling you, you can't, you can't charge a price anything less than $15, right? It's really the same thing we were doing here. We started out with a price, the price ceiling said, no, 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 it's too low. At the lowest, you can charge us $75. Here, it's, it's kind of like the lowest that you can kind of pay your workers here is $15. Works very similar. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Let's say, so what we want to do here is at this new minimum wage, the amount of labor demanded, and here's where the labor market's a little bit different. I think general good markets are easy because demand is like consumers. Like I usually want to buy things and the people producing it are the companies. Like they're the ones making it and selling it. Here, who's demanding labor? The companies or the teams, right? Whoever we're looking at, the organizations. Who's supplying labor? You and me. Like that's like our kind of frame of reference in the labor market is more so through the supply curve, right? I, I doubt very many, a lot of us have been on the other side and been like the people who are actually hiring the workers, right? So if we think about quantity demanded here, because I increase the price of workers, companies aren't going to want to hire as many people, right? So we've really got this uh, quantity supplied is right, sorry, quantity demanded is right here. And if we think about where the quantity supply is at $15, well, hell, a lot more people are going to want to work if the minimum wage is $15 an hour as opposed to $7.25. So we see here, right, quantity demanded is much higher than quantity supplied. People want to work more than there are jobs available. And so we would say there we have, right, a shortage. At that price for labor, at that wage, fewer people, oh, sorry, thank you. At that minimum wage, there are not many companies who want to provide as many jobs as there are people who are demanding to kind of work those jobs. And like I said, you could, instead of number of workers, you could break this down into hours. So really what we're seeing here at that $15 minimum wage, this is the number of jobs that are going to be available. So this was going to be where the new equilibrium is, right? Because it doesn't matter that these people want to work. There's only this many jobs, right? So we're stuck here at this new quantity, which is lower. You think about my quantity demand with the price floor ends up being my new equilibrium quantity and the new equilibrium price will be whatever that price for that minimum wage was set at, right? Because I'm not able to kind of pay a wage less than that, okay? Any questions on that? Okay with this? All right, and this is like a very relevant example because <laughs> this is like kind of what's going on right now um, or at least they're, they're kind of pushing for it. But you know, if I'm, if I'm a team or an organization and I look at this, what I'm really predicting is that a minimum wage will see fewer people working in the stadium. So what do you think these teams are gonna do? How, why can they get away? And this is a much more in-depth discussion we could have, but I just wanna introduce it here. If I'm hiring fewer people because they cost me more money to employ now, what am I probably trying to do? I still need certain things to be done at the stadium. Yeah, I'm gonna to try to get robots basically, right? I'm gonna to try to, to switch over from labor to like capital intensive things, okay? Um, you know, you see this, I think even at like, uh, 
you know, fast food restaurants and stuff where they've started to put in these like little kiosks that are all electronic to kind of cut down the number of people they, they need working behind the register. That's the idea. If people get too expensive, well, robots start to look a lot more attractive. And I call, I call them robots, right? Machines or, you know, whatever, aut automation. So, um, okay. Uh, and, you know, we can think about this too. A very similar thing would exist, not just with like workers at the stadium, we can think about um, league minimums, right? If I increase the league minimum that a, a team can pay a player, they're going to carry fewer people on their bench or their roster. Um, and it would really just be kind of the, you know, everything would kind of match up perfectly. It's just instead of fewer stadium workers, you'd have fewer kind of bench players or kind of reserve players, practice squad players, you know, however you want to think about the lower end of that, that roster. Okay. No questions on any of this? All right. Okay. All right. So let's go back here. All right. Uh, so we talked about, about this already. Um, we kind of have the, the graph drawn, and I already mentioned, you know, the same, same sort of analysis would apply if we're thinking about league minimums, right? League minimums are just minimum wages for players in that specific league. There you go. Oh, we got time. I want to think about how long that is. We've got, what, 30 minutes? Um, so we're going to start to think about uh, what the output of sports teams or leagues are. And it'll look a little bit different from kind of our traditional companies that we think about. So we'll just start out with some ideas first, and then we'll get a little bit more into kind of maybe some, some mathematical equations that represent this. So what would be the output for the following company, right? What's Ford Motor Company, like what does it produce? Cars, trucks, every automobiles, right? That one's pretty easy. What about Facebook? What's, what, what's, what would, their, would their production be or their output? It's kind of weird. Yeah, it's kind of weird because there's really not like a cost, they don't have like a price, but they're really just trying to get as many people onto their network as possible, right? Um, and every time they kind of, produce one more user, that's, that's their production. Right? What about Ball State? Yeah, you guys. You guys are the product, right? They're trying to put out higher quality students, better placements, um, you know, which is comforting for you guys in the sense that what they're trying to produce and what they actually care about should be like good for you. Right? They care about you getting a good job and they care about you. They don't, they don't like low retention rates. They don't like low graduation rates, right? What about Alabama University football? What's their, their production? So you could think about it that way, right? Think about it in a couple different ways. A lot of times when we see lens through, or we see things through the sports lens, we think about wins, right? But the actual production, right, is gonna be um, not just wins, but you know, for the school, it's just putting the game on, right? The number of games played, right? We could think about maybe there, uh, maybe some of these schools don't just have a production function, but they have an indifference curve, right? They have some utility built in, but really we would argue at the lowest level, their output really is providing games. And maybe it's providing certain quality games, right? And they, don't, they measure themselves not just based off of did they play 15 games, but did they play 15 games with a certain level of quality match, right? So it gets a little bit, you know, when we're defining what the output is, uh, we really have to know kind of what these, these, uh, you know, these agents, these companies, or these sports teams are actually um, trying to maximize, right? And we're trying to maximize um, production, right? Depends on what we're trying to produce. Right? But, but generally, think about this as kind of the, uh, the number of games here. So for now, we'll assume um, that, you know, they don't just want to produce games. They want to produce high-quality games. We'll measure the high quality games that they're putting out there as wins, right? Uh, we could, you could probably get real weird with the stats on it and, you know, measure the number of games that they've been within one score or, you know, within so many points. You, you could break it down that way. Um, and it would just be a little more complicated. So what we're going to start is we're just trying to provide quality games and we'll measure that quality by the number of wins each season. Okay. So usually for writing a production function, um, I'm not going to waste time and kind of, Switch to this thing. So I think we can do this here. Can I do this here? No, because I'm going to 
Oh, yeah, I can. Here we go. So usually we think about, right, we have something that we're producing, right, and it's going to be some function. Usually we think of goods are, and we kind of already had this discussion, a function of labor and capital, right, my two inputs into the production process. Okay. So with this in mind, this is generally our production function, right, we're producing a certain quantity based off our labor and our capital inputs. Capital kind of meaning kind of machines or you know, think about it that way. Well, now our quantity is wins, right? And while we do have labor, we could break this down into things like I think what I call this is TO and then TD, so offensive and defensive talent. So if I'm thinking about this through the lens of football, maybe I'm thinking about it's not that I can just add players, I can add players of different types. And different types of players might have a different impact on my production, right? I don't think there's many people, I, you know, I know we all won't be familiar with the same sports or every league. I, I definitely am not. Uh, but you can think about in any sport where you had offensive and defensive players, you could argue that maybe the offense is more crucial to winning than the defense or vice versa. Right? So you have these multiple inputs that might have a varying effect on, on the change kind of in your wins as you add more of that input. Yeah. So what if you have a team that doesn't have an offense or a defense? Yeah, so probably, uh, what would I want to think about this? You could think about this as, um, yeah, it doesn't matter how you notate it, right? If you think that there's only one input, that it's a universal talent. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good example of this. So maybe if I'm building like a, uh, maybe if I'm building a team of individual, like an, more of an individual sport, I'm trying to build a team of like tennis players or something and, and kind of scoring the matches that they play. And yeah, I'm just trying to add one type of talent. Yeah, yeah, it just makes it easier, really. <laughs> um, but to kind of have that comparison to capital and labor, we typically think about this maybe as offensive and defensive talent. So I think that's what I hopefully have here next. Right? So I have it written down here. Now we could break this down even further, right? You could really go down down the rabbit hole. And if we think about a sport like football, why well, I, I can break this down to more than just offensive and defensive talent. I can break this down into positions, right? So my inputs are my whoever's playing specific positions on my team. And the reason why we treat them differently, um, you know, think about the sport of football. Many argue, and they're not wrong if we look at the data, that the amount of wins that an additional unit of quarterback ta talent could add is much higher than the number of additional wins that another unit of, you know, well, I don't want to pick on them, but we'll say an additional unit of punter on, for my punter, right, would have on, on the increase in the number of games I win. So we would see kind of this varying influence of each one of these positions on my production, which is wins, okay? So if we take this production function, really what I just kind of described there a little bit in words, if we want to kind of put it down mathematically, and all we're saying is here, the marginal production. So I use these words a lot already, marginal cost, marginal benefit. This idea of marginal is the additional production that comes from adding one unit of offensive talent. <laughs> hey, I love Pat McAfee, so I, I pick on punters, but I, I, do, I do enjoy his show, and, and I know they're, they're, they're important. So, uh, but here it's the additional production that we get from one more unit of offensive talent, right? So the change in offensive talent here, we can think about an additional unit of offensive talent would change the amount of wins we get. Um, kind of that ratio we'll refer to as the marginal production of offensive talent here. And then we have the same thing for defensive talent. Here it's the additional number of wins or the change we would see in wins from a you know, specific change in the units of our, of our defensive talent. Now we think that these are both greater than zero or at the worst, they're equal to zero, right? Adding additional talent, you know, we would most, in most circumstances think it couldn't decrease the number of games that you win. I would be weird if this was negative. Um, and actually I might have it in a slide so someone might be able to kind of guess into it, but what's maybe an example? Um, well, hold on, we'll hold off on that question because I, I think maybe a little bit, we need a little more context. So. Both of these marginal productions, right, follow this kind of law of diminishing returns, right? The very first unit of offensive talent I add to my team 
is really gonna help increase number of wins I get. As I add more and more units, right, they become less effective at increasing the number of wins I see. If for no other reason, I mean, let's say I've got a pretty good stock of talent to where I'm winning 15 out of 16 games, at most, how can, at most, how much can an additional unit of talent increase my wins? I'm only playing 16 games, I can only increase it by one, right? So as I stockpile more talent, I don't even have as much room to add additional wins there, right? So this idea is we add more talent, uh, either type here, uh, we see a smaller change in the number of wins or a smaller increase in the number of wins, right? So we have this diminishing kind of marginal product, okay? Uh, and, you know, another way to kind of think about this, if we broke it down by position, and let's just for the sake of argument make, when we're talking about these units of talent, let's just simplify it for a second and just say adding, um, you know, the same quality player, but just adding more of them, right? So let's say I had five quarterbacks, all the same talent. The first one that I bring onto my team is going to help my team win a, a lot more games, right? Let's say there's a, you know, five, we're in Indiana, so five Peyton Mannings out there, right? And when I put the first one on my team, hell, my team gets a lot better, right? I see a huge increase in the number of wins. So the marginal production of adding that unit of talent, that player was relatively high. I then add another Peyton Manning, right? Has same quality, same skills. Well, how many wins do they add to my team? Well, you can only have one quarterback on the field at a time, right? And it might help improve my number of wins to have a good backup in cases of injury, but that marginal production of that second quarterback isn't near as high, right? Then I say, I get another one. Well, the third string, stringer never even sees the field, right? So as I start adding more and more high quality quarterbacks, their marginal production is falling. I mean, and really, you know, if I'm thinking about how it falls, uh, it's probably something like this, right? So, right, if marginal production started here from that first unit, as I add more quarterbacks, it probably falls pretty quickly, right? Kind of approaching zero. Now, I said that these are typically, even though, you know, even if I add a third string quarterback, they still have some value, right? Even though they're not influencing the number of additional wins very much, you know, just having them on the, in practice or having them there in case of injury, there still is some value to them, right? Some production increase. What is a scenario where maybe you can envision adding more high quality quarterbacks could actually decrease marginal production or marginal wins? So you could think about it that way. Uh, that's a little bit more, not so much that the marginal production would be negative there, because there we're thinking more about trade-offs, like it's not, um, we haven't factored in any costs yet, right? So you're thinking about kind of the, the cost of, of talent, if I have a um, budget constraint, but let's, you know, if, even if I, let's say I take that budget constraint away, like in Major League Baseball, I can spend as much money as I want, <laughs> right? So maybe football wasn't the perfect example for this, but imagine we don't have a budget constraint, and that's kind of the, the world we're living in, in here for a second. How could it still get negative? So the example I always um, remember, and I, this would have been the Jets, right? And I can't remember who their starting quarterback was, but they, they hired Tim Tebow, and like it made this huge quarterback controversy, right? And so potentially adding other high quality players in the same position, you may just get a negative change in, in marginal wins because that player causes kind of externalities, some negative externalities by simply being on the team, um, causing friction in the locker room or something like that because they're, they're not the starter, right? Or because you have two high quality players and you have to make a decision between the two. I'm sure someone's going to remind me about who that quarterback was. Mark Sanchez, there you go. <laughs> um, my, my, my memory of sports sometimes kind of comes and goes. So I knew, I knew, I knew it was Tim Tebow, though, they're kind of ca causing the controversy. So we, we could see it go negative, but, but generally we think about it as even, even those backups have some small positive effect on the production. Um, oh, uh, we'll dive into that later. I was going to say, we can think about, too, there may be um, differences in the marginal production of a particular position that are dependent on what you already have at other positions, right? So football is a good example where we say, 
the marginal production of a quarterback could be higher or lower, even given the same skill level, the same units of talent. If the offensive line is better, they're going to be able to add that bringing on that quarterback is going to be able to add a lot more additional wins than if you had a bad offensive line. All right, so there might be some complementarity in these, these, these productions where marginal production can be higher for a particular position based off of what you already have at other positions. Right, but we, we won't dive into that too much yet. I just want to kind of mention that there. We already talked through this, and then I kind of, kind of mentioned this bullet point as well, where maybe we get to a point where it's negative, but very unlikely. So um, we can think about, we've got this, this marginal production, which we've described as diminishing, right? Decreasing as we add more units of talent. So what's gonna, what's, what is that gonna do to the marginal costs of acquiring talent, okay? Well, we're gonna set this up, um, you know, anytime we use the word marginal, it's the additional cost that's gonna come from hiring an additional unit of talent. Like I said, we don't want to quite think of these as adding players. We, we can sometimes to make uh, things a little bit more clear or intuitive, but really we're talking about adding units of talent, which are some measure right, of the quality of these players, right? If I want, you know, because we start talking about the cost of talent to go out and get uh, the best quarterback in the league, it's going to cost me way more than the worst quarterback, right? But the reason why is it's not that the marginal cost is different, it's that I'm buying a higher quantity of talent units, to, right? For, to get that top QB, I'm, I'm buying a lot fewer talent units, from, you know, to get that, that worst QB in the league. And so the price per unit of talent is still the same. It's just that one of these players has a higher number of units of talent, okay? So what we want to think through this whole thing is that the cost per unit of talent is the same. Okay, so um, I can start to think about, well, what's the marginal cost of winning then? Right? Because I know that to win more games, I can add more talent, but what's the marginal cost to winning? Okay. Well, if the cost per unit, here, let's, yeah, here we go, right? If the cost per unit of talent is the same amount of money, then it should be kind of inversely related to that marginal production. So think about it this way. Right, we can break this down into players, right? Um, we said that first unit of talent that you add to your team has the highest production value, or the highest marginal production, adds the highest number of additional wins, okay? So maybe initially, and let's, instead of thinking about this as football, maybe I'm just thinking about this uh, in a more universal sport. So maybe this is like, um, let's do basketball because they have a smaller roster, right? When I add that, that first unit of talent onto my, my basketball roster, right, I might win an additional five games. Okay? When I add the second unit of talent, purchase the second unit of talent, maybe it only increases the number of games I win by four. And then the third only increases it by three and so on and so forth. Okay? Well, if I think about that then, that first unit of talent got me five additional wins, right? And the cost, you know, might have been let's say the cost per, for a unit of talent is $10. So those first five games, I only paid $10 to get those additional five wins. The second unit of talent still cost me $10, but I only added four additional wins. So my kind of per win cost was actually higher, right? Initially, when I spent $10, I got five wins. So each win was only $2 per win, right? My marginal cost for those first five wins was $2. When I hired that second of unit talent and only added four wins, well, it still cost me $10 for that additional unit of talent. Each win there cost me $2.50. Then let's say to get, you know, I hired my third unit of talent. Cost is $10, I only win three additional games. Now the cost per win is $3.33. The marginal cost will continue to rise as I wanna win more and more games because that marginal production of each unit of talent is, is going down, but that marginal cost, or sorry, the marginal production for each unit of talent is going down, even though the cost per unit of talent has remained the same, right? So we wanna think about it as you can think about the marginal cost of talent is kind of constant there, but the marginal cost for wins, because production is, is the marginal production is diminishing, 
marginal costs are actually increasing there per win. Okay. I might break that down starting off next class a little bit more, writing down some of those numbers, but hopefully the, kind of that, that idea you know, kind of kind of helped, helped solidify a little bit. Are there any questions on that? All right, yeah, I'll probably break it down a little bit, have some numbers where we kind of look at it, uh, like in an Excel spreadsheet or something. Uh, let me get rid of this real quick. So what I say here, when marginal production is higher. Oh yeah, when, when marginal production is high, uh, that means we can pay kind of the same price, we get a much higher number of wins, right? So the kind of cost per win, the additional cost per win is much lower there. All right. Um, let's go here for a second. Um, this relationship between production, oh, I don't want this marker. The relationship between production and costs, marginal production, marginal costs. So you think about here, we're measuring the y-axis in dollar amounts. Um, here, we're going to think about wins. Right? So, or now what do I want to do? I don't want to, yeah, I'll do this. Um, so we think about that very first win. Right, so go from zero to one, right? To get that very first win, right? I'm gonna have to add some talent to my team, right? But the amount of talent that I need to add might be relatively low, okay? Because that very first unit of talent that I add to my team is gonna have the highest marginal production, right? So maybe I can get by with only hiring a half a unit of talent um, to get that very first win. So if I'm only getting, you know, if I only have to get half a unit of talent to get that first win. And let's say, I don't know, talent uh, cost, just to keep it easy. Obviously these numbers don't make sense in the context of like million dollar contracts, but we'll keep it easy at $10, right? So you get that first win, I only need half a unit of talent, right? Because those initial units of talent that I hire have very high marginal production. So um, let's say, right? I get half a unit of talent, that would only cost me $5, right? And that's how I could get that, that first win, right? Now I think about how do I get that second win, right? When we get that second win, the marginal production of talent starts to go down. So maybe instead of half a unit, now I need a whole unit of talent to get me that additional one win, right? So now I have to um, can think about here, I had to hire a whole unit of talent to get that from one to two wins. And so my marginal costs are going to be quite a bit higher, right? What if I want to get that third? Well, maybe get that third win. Now the marginal production of talent has fallen even more. I need two additional units to get one more win. Well, if I have to pay two units of additional talent, now I'm all the way up here at $20, right? And, you know, I can kind of continue with this idea that to add each additional win, I'm going to have to add more and more units of talent because after I get a pretty high number of units of talent, that marginal production starts to fall and get really close to zero where, you know, if I go all the way down here, if we do football, right, just to have a low number of games here, to go from that 15th to that 16th win, maybe I have to add something like, I don't know, 100 units of talent. And so there, that, that marginal cost of that, final 16th win would be insanely high, right? But the reason why, if we kind of connect this, what this is really telling us is the marginal cost per win curve. But really what's going on behind the scenes, why this marginal cost per win is increasing is because each additional win requires a higher number of units of additional talent, right? And if the cost of a unit of talent is constant, well, if I need a higher number of units, I'm just gonna be paying a higher, higher value, right? Or that win's gonna cost me a higher amount of additional dollars, right? Marginal cost will be higher. Okay. Excuse me. Any questions on that? Hopefully that kind of gets that. I know I'm kind of saying, I was breaking it down in words, but maybe you could think about it here. I needed half a unit here to get that first win, one unit to get that second win, two units to get that third win, right? And then we kind of could continue on through there.
have any questions on that? All right. Um, let me think what I want to do here. Because I don't really want to start the next thing. I think we'll just stop there for today then. Um, so we'll pick up, well, where were we at? We'll pick up here again next class and then kind of quickly enter, enter into the discussion of competitive markets and then explore how monopoly markets would kind of alter some of the things that we would see, eventually getting back to the ticket market. And even though today we talked about it as though it's perfectly competitive, in practice, it's usually a monopoly market. And so we'll see how, if there is a monopoly that exists in the ticket market, how that's gonna change some of what we talked about today, okay? Any questions or no, we're good? All right, Thursday after, or I'll post an online quiz after class today, um, we'll kind of have, just one question related to, today, to the, today's material. Um, so it should be pretty easy. Just get on, get that done before we start next class on Thursday. And then Thursday after class, I'll likely post kind of our, our first homework. We haven't went over near enough to like complete it, but at least you can kind of start to work on some of the early problems, okay? All right, and if I haven't gotten back to you, I think I have a couple emails sitting in my inbox about project ideas. I'll get back to you, uh, hopefully, when I get back to my office, if not tomorrow morning, I'll start shipping away through those emails. Okay. Uh, not for a while. I think February 19th or kind of, kind of towards the next couple of weeks. Right. Um, so yeah, you got some time. So to figure that out. Okay. All right. We'll see you guys on Thursday.